Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support, please subscribe. The Horrific Interrogation of Catherine Howard, Fifth Wife to Henry VIII. In our previous video, we spoke about Catherine Howard and looked into the time she spent under the care of her step-grandmother, Agnes, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. We also spoke in great detail of how Catherine was potentially groomed by the men she had in her company, for she was only a child. We know that after Catherine's time with her step-grandmother, that she became a lady-in-waiting for Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, and that this is where Henry became infatuated with the young teenage Catherine Howard. Catherine and Henry married in 1540, and Catherine must have felt like she had the whole world at her fingers, for she was Queen of England, but Henry was overweight at this point in his life. And although he had already a son by Jane Seymour, a spare would certainly strengthen his dynasty. Catherine managed to keep her past under wraps for the time being, and Henry showered her with gifts and he indulged her. Catherine was certainly subjected to her marital duty. But with Henry away from court more often than not, Catherine found comfort in the arms of another man, Thomas Culpepper. It is unknown if the relationship went beyond the realms of just friendship, but this is the relationship that ultimately sealed Catherine's fate. You see, Catherine, when she was around 13, was in a relationship with a man called Henry Mannix, her music teacher, and then there was a man called Francis Deerham, secretary to her step-grandmother. But both of these were before Catherine had ever met the king. It is said that Henry would have forgiven Catherine for her pre-marital activities, but the fact that Culpepper confessed and Catherine's dirty laundry was aired for the world to see made his thoughts of mercy turn to rage, and poor Catherine didn't stand a chance. Love letters were found between Catherine and Thomas, and in one he referred to her as his sweet little fool. It is believed that the meetings between Catherine and Thomas were made possible with the help of Jane Boleyn, or Rochford if you like. She had arranged secret meetings between the pair. And it is also thought that these meetings went on for months with no one suspecting a thing. It was only when word reached the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, of Catherine's situation and her behaviour whilst in her step-grandmother's household that Catherine's world came tumbling down. What is interesting is that Thomas Cramner never approved of the marriage between Catherine and Henry, not because he disliked Catherine, but because of her grandfather, Thomas Howard, who was a strong opponent. Cramner was informed by a man called John Lascelles that his sister, Mary Hall, used to work in the household of Catherine when she was just a teenager, and that Catherine had fornicated with Henry Mannix, Francis Deerham and Thomas Culpepper. Thomas Cramner must have seen this as an opportunity to discredit any supporters of Catherine, and with Catherine out of the way, he could then suggest a name of a bride who, like Anne Boleyn, would favour religious reform. During Cramner's investigations, he spoke with Mary Hall, the woman who worked in Catherine's household as a teenager, and she told him about Catherine's relationship with Mannix in 1536, she said that she had gone to see Mannix to warn him of his behaviour, and he told her the following. Hold thy peace, woman. I know her well enough. My designs are of a dishonest kind, and from the liberties the young lady has allowed me, I doubt not of being able to elect my purpose. She hath said to me that I shall have her maiden head, though it be painful to her, no doubting, but I will be good to her hereafter. Mary then claimed that for a hundred nights or more, Francis Deerham had crept into the lady's dormitory and climbed, dressed in a doublé and hose, into Catherine's bed. It was then, on the 2nd of November, that Cramner presented the written statement of the allegations to Henry VIII. Initially, Henry acted with total disbelief. He felt the accusations had no truth behind them. But nevertheless, Henry still ensured that an investigation was had and that Cramner looked into matters more thoroughly. You are not to desist until you have got to the bottom of the pot. Henry then told Thomas Rithosely that he could not believe it to be true, 
and yet, the accusations having once been made, he could be satisfied till the certainty hereof was known. But he could not, in any wise, that in the Inquisition any spark of scandal should arise against the Queen. Initially, Henry gave the order that Catherine was to be confined to her apartments with just Jane Boleyn in attendance. It is thought, though, as reported by Eustace Chapwee, that Catherine refused to eat or drink anything, and that she did not cease from weeping or crying like a mad woman, so much that they must take away things by which she may hasten her death. Cramner then immediately actioned an investigation, and Jane Boleyn was questioned. Jane confessed due to the fear of being tortured, and she admitted that she had guarded the back stairs to Catherine's rooms many times, so that Thomas Culpepper could pay the Queen secret visits. Culpepper's rooms were immediately searched, and the love letter that I've previously mentioned was found from Catherine. In there she had written, It makes my heart die to think what fortune I have, that I cannot be always in your company. This letter was then taken by Thomas Cramner, and discreetly passed to the King, Henry was at the time praying in the Chapel Royal in Hampton Court Palace, and the date was the 1st of November, 1541, only a year and a half after Catherine and Henry got married. Catherine was arrested, and it is said that she broke free from the guards and ran to the doors of the Chapel Royal, where she believed Henry to be at prayer. Catherine screamed for the King for mercy, but her screams were in vain. Archbishop Thomas Cramner visited the Queen in her apartments on the 6th of November. His main objective was to obtain a confession that she had committed adultery. Without it, no one could proceed against her, for pre-marital fornication was neither a crime nor acceptable grounds for an annulling of a marriage. He found the Queen in such lamentation and heaviness, as I never saw no creature, so that it would have pitied any man's heart in the world to have looked upon. Catherine knew all too well the fate that could await her, for Anne Boleyn left a legacy that scared her. Cramner, unable to get much sense out of the Queen, returned the following day. He told her that if she made a full confession, the king would probably show mercy. She eventually confessed that Francis Deerham called her wife, and she used the term husband, and that it was common gossip in the household that they would marry. He had many times moved me unto the question of matrimony, but she refused all his proposals. Catherine made a serious mistake with this confession, because under the law at the time... If she had made a pre-contract of marriage with Deerham, her marriage to Henry was invalid and therefore she could not be convicted of adultery. Catherine claimed that Francis Deerham, the man claiming to be her former lover, had actually raped her and that there was no pre-contract of marriage, but her pleas and her words were of no use because then, on the 23rd of November, Catherine was stripped of her title as Queen. Catherine admitted that she had on many occasion gone to bed with Deerham. He hath lain with me, sometimes in his doublé and hose, and two or three times naked, but not so naked that he had nothing upon him, for he had always at the least his doublé, and as I do think his hose also, but I mean naked when his hose was put down. Catherine claimed that she had not willingly had sexual intercourse with Deerham, and that he had raped her with importunate force. Catherine was then questioned about Thomas Culpepper. Cramner told her that they had heard a rumour that they were romantically involved and were about to marry. Catherine replied, "'What should you trouble me thereabouts, for you know I will not have you, and if you heard such report, you know more than I.' Cramner was searching for someone who had committed adultery with the Queen and Thomas Culpepper was to be arrested and questioned. 
Catherine also confessed about her relationship with Henry Mannix. My sorrow I can by no writing express. Nevertheless, I trust your most benign nature will have some respect unto my youth, my ignorance, my frailness, my humble confession of my faults and plain declaration of the same referring me wholly unto your grace's pity and mercy, first at the flattering and fair persecutions of Mannix. Being but a young girl, I suffered him at sundry times to handle and touch the secret parts of my body, which never became me with honesty to permit, nor him to require. Cramner thought these confessions would please Henry, but they did not. Henry wanted more time to think about the situation and ordered that Catherine be moved and that the three men sent to the Tower of London to be questioned. Catherine was then held at Sion Abbey for the duration of her imprisonment whilst Henry stayed at Hampton Court. Henry had seen Catherine for the last time the day she was arrested. When Henry Mannix was questioned, he admitted he had been employed by the Duchess Agnes to teach Catherine music and singing and admitted having trying to seduce her. When the Duchess discovered them kissing, she had beaten them both and commanded that they should never be alone together again. This had not deterred Mannix and on another occasion she had agreed he might caress her private parts. In his words he had felt more than was convenient. However, he told his interrogators, upon his damnation and most extreme punishment of his body, he never knew her carnally. Then, over the next couple of weeks, a trial for Thomas Culpepper and Francis Derham took place, and both were subsequently executed at Tyburn. Henry Mannox had been incredibly lucky to escape this fate. The Privy Council felt that he had committed no crime and released him. However, Thomas Culpepper was then beheaded, but Francis Derham was hung, drawn and quartered. Then, as customary for the time, both men had their heads placed onto spikes and displayed on London Bridge as a warning to the city's residents that treason, especially against the King, was no laughing matter. It is believed that Catherine was aware of these executions and the fear she must have felt knowing deep down that she must be next must have been absolutely horrific and terrifying. What is sad is that whilst Catherine was imprisoned, a new law was passed, a law that made it treason for a queen consort not to disclose her sexual history to the king within the first 12 days of marriage as well as to commit adultery against her royal husband. This law was called the Royal Assent by Commission Act of 1541, and this act meant that there was no need for a trial, and the evidence was therefore stacked against the helpless Catherine Howard, who was then sentenced to death. Catherine had been charged with leading an abominable, base, carnal, voluptuous and vicious life, like a common harlot with diverse persons. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.